If you go down to the woods today, you're in for a big surprise. If you go down to the woods today, you'd better go in disguise. For when the ground is cold and covered in snow, you'll find yourself in the lair of the Wendigo. According to Algonquin legend, there was a dark and evil spirit which had the power to possess and control the minds of men and women. This entity stalked its prey in the coldest months, entering the dreams of its victims and forcing them to seek sustenance in the flesh of their fellow man. If ever the victim consumed the body of another, there was no going back. They would forever be transformed into a horrifying creature one which constantly craved human meat, with an appetite that was never fulfilled. They would become what is known as a Wendigo. Born of the Native American tribes that inhabited the colder climates of the northeastern US and parts of Canada, the Wendigo is a legend of two halves. Its name applied to both the evil spirit which possessed the victim and the physical being that they would become after consuming the flesh of another. The spirit was attracted to two opposite ends of the social hierarchy, those who were greedy and spiteful, and those who were desperate and starving. It was said to haunt people in their sleep, filling their dreams with thoughts of cannibalism and a desire to kill and eat others, starting with those closest to them. The physical Wendigo, on the other hand, was far more terrifying. These were the remnants of those possessed by the spirit, Often encountered in woodland settings, they were described as tall and thin, with pale flesh pulled tight over their bones. They had a normal human head, which was somewhat deformed, with gaunt cheeks, dark pits for eyes, and lips that had wasted away, exposing their razor-sharp teeth. Their fingers were long and spindly, and ended in extremely sharp claws, which were used for ripping apart their victims. Wendigos were said to be fast, strong and agile, able to stalk their prey over extended periods of time. They had been known to lure their victims by impersonating the voices of friends and relatives. Although this was simply a legend used to elucidate the ills of winter, coldness, famine and starvation, as well as the stigmas attached to greed and the accumulation of wealth, it has since evolved into something more. Listed as a modern-day cryptid, people still report encountering Wendigos to this day. The question is whether the legend is fueling these sightings, or whether people are using the legend to explain something else that they may be seeing. Finding credible reports of these encounters was impossible, as there are little to no famous incidents on record, but we did, however, find some. Not one of the accounts we are about to present is backed up by any kind of evidence. They are purely anecdotal, but intriguing nonetheless. The first of these encounters takes place in New Brunswick, Canada, on a property just outside Jemseg, near Grand Lake. Submitted to Reddit in April of 2015, the user states that he and his wife had moved to the area the previous summer. The property came with about four acres of land, and was largely surrounded by dense woods. They spent the first four months renovating the household before settling in for what would prove to be a bitterly cold winter. The snowfall at the beginning of that year would be the deepest the region had seen for decades. Their closest neighbours lived about a mile or two further along Route 695, and the total whiteout would only add to that sense of isolation. 
not that they minded the peace and quiet. The sun began to set just after 4pm on those early winter evenings, and with the usual ambient sounds deadened by the snow, an eerie and deep purple twilight descended upon the scene night after night. At around 1am on the 24th of January, the user reports that he was awoken by one of his dogs barking and scratching at the back door. Thinking that it needed to go out to do its business, he left his wife sleeping in bed and made his way downstairs. As soon as he opened the back door, the dog made a dash for the tree line surrounding the property, growling and barking at something in the darkness beyond. No matter how many times he tried to call her back, she just kept on running without so much as a glance back towards the house. After hastily pulling on a pair of snow boots and grabbing a torch, he ran out across his yard and soon found himself standing at the edge of the woods, calling her name and shining a light into the thickets of trees. He could hear the snapping of branches off in the distance as his dog made her way through the brush, still growling and barking at whatever she could sense was out there. But then, it suddenly went quiet. He took a step just inside the tree line and stood still for a moment, listening. There was not even a whisper on the wind. He took a few more steps forward, called again and still heard nothing. He stated that he must have walked another 20 feet before he found himself in amongst a grouping of European white birches. And that is when he heard it. Babe? It was his wife's voice, coming from behind him. He turned around, fully expecting to see her standing at the edge of the tree line, but there was no one there. Then he heard it a second time. Babe! It was at this point that he realised something was wrong. As before, it sounded as if it came from behind him, but now it was from deeper inside the woods. He shone his torch into the branches, panning back and forth, when he suddenly noticed a movement about ten feet ahead of him. What he originally thought were branches stood up to reveal a long spindly figure. When the torch beam passed over its face, the eyes did not reflect any light. They were just dark black orbs. He had no time to think about what he was seeing as he turned and ran back towards the house bursting out of the tree line and tearing across the open space of his backyard. Only when he reached his back door and saw that his dog was sitting there waiting for him did he look back, but there was nothing there. When he went inside, he found his wife still fast asleep in bed. The user finished his post by saying, I don't know if the thing I saw was a wendigo, but it fits the description. It might have been a ghost or hell even an alien. It might even have been my imagination, but the sound of my wife's voice and those eyes, it was very real to me. I don't know what I saw that night, but I can tell you that I haven't been back into those woods. Later that same year, a young man by the name of John Crowder would have a chilling experience whilst working in Brasher State Forest, St. Lawrence, New York. John worked as a contractor cutting and marking trails through the dense woodland in preparation for a public opening the following year. Unlike many of his co-workers, he was from out of state and often found himself spending his weekends in a cabin at the newly established trailhead whilst everyone else went home. During December, the first winter snows began to hit the region and it would be just after 10pm on the weekend of the 12th that John would receive an unwanted visitor. As he recalls, the snow was beginning to fall in earnest and he had just put another log on the fire. He was climbing back into his bunk to continue reading his book when he was surprised by a loud thud on the roof. After a brief moment of shock, he reasoned that a clump of snow must have fallen from the branches of the tree overhanging the cabin and thought nothing more of it. But about five minutes later, he was disturbed again this time by a light, almost inaudible scratching sound above his head. Again he quickly dismissed it. Either some branches were scraping across the roof, or a raccoon had decided to brave the elements in search of food. 
In any case, the sound stopped abruptly after a few more minutes, and after another hour or so, John decided to turn over and go to sleep. He had just closed his eyes when he was startled by another loud thud, then another, and another, and another, and then nothing. John remembered a chill running up his spine as it sounded as if someone had just walked across the roof of the cabin. It was definitely not a raccoon. The thuds had been too heavy and they sounded bipedal. He reasoned that someone was playing around, but then he remembered just how deep in the woods he was and wondered who would have been out there at that time and in that weather. He knew he had to go and check it out, but for obvious reasons felt apprehensive. For a time, he sat looking out of his window to see if he could spot any movement. Given the low temperatures, he was already fully clothed. He slipped on his boots, opened the door, and tentatively stepped out onto the balcony, and there he stood in the silence of the night, as the snow fell without a sound, knowing that there was someone out there watching him. There was nothing on the roof, but his eyes were drawn to the high branches of a nearby tree. He couldn't see anything in the darkness, and he never understood why, but for some reason, he had the strangest, most overpowering feeling that there was a presence there. He went to switch on his torch, but something stopped him. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he heard a voice telling him that if he did, he would not live to see the light of day. Instead, he turned around and went back inside, locking the doors behind him. Hours passed by and nothing else happened, but he had been so unnerved by what he felt that he could not even close his eyes. Eventually, sleep did find him. He awoke several hours later. Looking out of the window, he was relieved to see that the sun was just beginning to rise. The scene before him was peaceful and silent, but in the half-light, he spotted on the balcony just outside the doors bare humanoid footprints in the virgin snow. And in that moment, he knew that something had been watching him whilst he slept. Although John didn't see anything that night, when his colleagues returned the following Monday and he told them about his experience, most of them laughed and joked about it. One or two, however, were dead serious when they told him that he'd been visited by a Wendigo. Our final account comes from Charles Chuck Latimer, who had his encounter published in an issue of the 14 Times more than 20 years ago. Chuck was a hunter from Delta County, Michigan. Born in 1939, he had spent many years hunting the woods and forests of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. During that time, he had become well accustomed to the outdoors. He had heard many strange tales about the forests of North America. He had even heard some weird sounds on previous camping trips, but he had never seen anything out of the ordinary and didn't believe in any of the stories he had been told. Relatives described him as an honest, salt-of-the-earth kind of man, with a no-nonsense approach to his endeavours. The story of his encounter was published some years after his untimely death and was submitted by his son, Andrew. It took place in December 1983, whilst his father was on a hunting trip in the Gwynn State Forest of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Chuck was three days into this particular excursion when he came across something he was never able to explain, and which kept him from doing solo hunts for many years afterwards. It was early afternoon, and the going had been tough. He had tracked a large buck for some distance over difficult terrain, which was blanketed by snow. He finally got eyes on his quarry when he approached the edge of an expansive clearing. Being some distance away and downwind of the animal, he had time to be patient as he carefully moved into a good position and took aim with his Remington rifle. When he finally took the shot, he was disappointed to see the buck twitch and then bolt into the trees beyond. He had hit it in the flank, but his aim had been off by a good three inches. Still, if it was wounded, it would soon succumb to its injuries, and all Chuck had to do from that point was follow the trail of blood. 
He was about halfway across the clearing when things started to get a little weird. He described that the air seemed to turn thick and dull and that everything went quiet. All the usual woodland sounds died out and he was suddenly overcome by a peculiar feeling of vulnerability, as if he was exposed. He continued forward, but not without a degree of trepidation. Just inside the tree line on the other side of the clearing, he saw the buck lying on its side, its flanks bellowing as hot air, visible in the low temperatures, poured from its nostrils. He got to within 30 feet of the dying animal, hunting knife in hand, when he noticed something strange. Just behind the deer, there was a mass of white, which at first glance looked like a pile of snow, but now he could see that it was moving, as if attached to the wounded buck. He would move just a few steps closer before stopping dead in his tracks. His mouth hung agape as he watched an inhuman face rise up from behind his kill. It had blood around its mouth, and according to Chuck, was wearing the most evil expression he had ever seen. It suddenly moved into a defensive posture, crouching over the deer as if protecting it. It then emitted a high-pitched screech, which was enough to send Chuck running for the opposite side of the clearing. He managed to get back to his camp, and abandoned his trip early. As far as his son knew, Chuck never went hunting in those woods ever again, when speaking about the creature, his father recalled that it was incredibly thin, and even though it was low to the ground, he could tell that it was very tall. Its skin was almost as white as the snow. He would often tell this story to those closest to him. Even as he was terminally ill with cancer and lying on his deathbed, he would recount this tale one last time. So what are we to make of these stories? Are they simply tall tales, or did these people really see something out in the woods? For us, the biggest problem with so-called Wendigo encounters is that we know this entity is nothing more than a legend. In the original folklore, the Wendigo did not have a physical presence at all. It only existed in spirit form. Its physical manifestation only came about later, and even then, there are multiple descriptions regarding its appearance. Whilst most tribes described it as depicted in this episode, others said that it looked more like a man-eating Sasquatch, and particularly in later years, and especially since the advent of the internet, modern descriptions suggest that it has the skull of a deer for a head, complete with antlers. Unlike the Skinwalker, another Native American legend, Wendigos are unable to shapeshift, so these discrepancies in appearance only serve to cast further doubt upon its physical existence. Before modern medicine, many illnesses and mental conditions were said to be caused by evil spirits, and with this in mind, it's easy to see how the legend was perpetuated. The northern US and parts of Canada are bitterly cold during winter, and there would, without a doubt, have been times when food was scarce in such harsh environments. This perhaps led to some individuals becoming so desperate that they resorted to eating the flesh of the dead, an act seen as the ultimate taboo. It is possible that the legend was born out of a need to both explain and deter these actions, as well as to establish morality against greed and personal accumulation of food or wealth. This encouraged individuals instead to share their supplies for the good of the tribe. All that said, could people be encountering something else in the woods, and incorrectly attributing these sightings to the Wendigo? After all, the forests of North America are so vast, there are places within them that people have never visited. It's not difficult to consider the possibility of a long-lost people still eking out an existence deep in those interiors, or possibly something else entirely non-human. There are some videos which may suggest this to be the case, and whilst they may be nothing more than hoaxes, they are rather intriguing. All the clips we are about to show have been attributed to possible Wendigo sightings. This video was uploaded in 2009, and shows a group of people sitting around a campfire. At some point, a strange vocalisation is heard, 
just as a humanoid figure is recorded walking on all fours in the background, skirting around the campsite. This stick's getting pretty damn sharp, eh? Oh fuck, the smoke is in my face! Well, you've been sharpening it for like two hours. No. Do you hear something? It's a dog. Okay. It's probably shy though. Yeah, I'm gonna take pictures now. This could be genuine, however, we find it odd that there appears to be a light source on the ground near to and pointing directly towards the creature as it passes by. Also the way the camera is aimed in that direction at nothing in particular, instead of focusing on the people around the campfire, makes this seem a little staged. The following was recorded on the 1st of January 2014, and shows a group of guys exploring an abandoned property. They begin to hear strange sounds coming from the other side of the house, and when they investigate, they bump into something that sends them running. Look, is that a dress? I don't know. That's disgusting. <coughs> Was that you? I don't hear anything. That's nothing, come on. Okay. Wait, the backyard. There's nothing. You wanna go back? I saw a bat. Yeah. Shh. What? What is it? it? Sounds like it's on the other side. What? No, where we first came in. Yeah, it's back there. Turn the light on. Sounds like it's in the corner. What the fuck is that? Oh, shit! Which way's the exit? Which way's the exit? <laughs> the footage is a little dark, and we don't get a clear shot of the creature. The whole situation seems contrived, and almost cliché in this day and age, so we're of the opinion that this is staged. The next video was shot in 2005, and uploaded in 2011. It was filmed at a remote graveyard surrounded by woodland, and the person holding the camera only spotted something strange when he reviewed the footage six years after it was recorded. It seems to show a humanoid figure peeping out from behind a gravestone, which many people have said looks like an alien, but others have described it as a wendigo. The time delay between recording and uploading is interesting, but it could easily be someone standing behind the gravestone, pushing a mannequin into shot, and then retracting it before the camera pans back. This final video was found on a camera phone from the mid-2000s, hence the poor quality. No one has come forth to claim the footage, and the owner of the phone has never been traced. It depicts a couple walking through the forest and coming face to face with a very strange creature, which then proceeds to attack them. The footage ends when the phone is dropped to the ground. Do you see that? Over there, look, 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 over there. Do you see that? What the hell? Wait, 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 that, because that was it again, right there, right there. Wait, 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 wait. I don't like this. You see that? Right there. Look, 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 look. Oh my god. That's not an animal. Uh, I don't like it. Okay, 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 fuck. <laughs> go, 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 go. Go, go.
If this is a hoax, then it is very well done, but for us, a possible giveaway is the sound of the creature, which is extremely clear and does not seem to vary in volume despite varying distances away from the recording device. Also, the quality of the footage leaves a lot to be desired. When all is said and done, it seems the legend of the Wendigo is just that, a legend. It survives today in Native American folklore and internet creepypastas. It also lends its name to an actual medical condition known as Wendigo psychosis, whereby the sufferer develops the craving for, or fear of, consuming human flesh, and for most people, that's about as real as it gets. On the other hand, we can't help but ask the question of whether the legend developed for deeper reasons. Was there something more that the Algonquin people knew about? Could there be something out there in those woods?